N E D D. That's always the fun part, just like getting started and letting people know <laughs> that we're open. <laughs> I love you with your pink and green on today. I need to step away one second, okay? Okay, go ahead. As a consultant, Natalie, what do you do um, for CARICOM? Oh, I'm a consultant sometimes now with, with CARICOM, but I, I used to be a trade negotiator. Oh, wow. That's big time. <laughs> International trade agreements. Really? That's impressive. Oh, wow. Thank you. It was fun. Wow. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ife Taya Ojolade. I am so excited about this conversation today. We are continuing to celebrate Caribbean Heritage Month. And like I do with things where I am not an expert, I like to get out of the way. So today, um, our, um, I was going to say director. So you direct a lot of stuff. <laughs> The office manager, she directs our operations at a healing paradigm. Miss Alethea Vanello is going to facilitate this conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to her. So thank you, Alethea, for facilitating this conversation. I also want to thank our panelists today. We have Miss Nat Natalie Rochester from Mango Tells Limited, and she is going to, um, I know, feed us because I have already gotten great information from just listening to her and kind of the pre conversation. And then we We'll have our brother Rakumba Ned. He is going to be on in just a second, but I'm going to turn this conversation over. So thank you, Natalie, for agreeing to have this conversation. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Alethea. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Ojolade, for even being open enough to allowing us to have this conversation. Um, as we talk about a lot of Pan-African things, things of the As African diaspora, we're excited that in the month of June in America, in the U.S., that we have Caribbean American Heritage Month. And as part of that, we wanted to celebrate the art and culture of the Caribbean. We're gonna be talking about a lot of things because just the arts and culture in and of itself, that is a broad topic to even discuss in just an hour. But we're gonna delve into some of the things today. And I'm excited to have my sister friend with us here, Natalie Rochester. We go back way back from high school days. Way like back. To say. And in that time, not only have we grown as friends, but we've had a chance to journey on this road through school and education, um, through various things and topics that we discuss. Me being a Jamaican American and her being a Jamaican who has had an American experience, among other things. But just a little bit about Natalie. She is an of international trade and development consultant based in Kingston, Jamaica. She has over 16 years experience in international trade and investment as a business sector assessment analysis of small firms, doing policy analysis, research and trade promotion. But she is here now in regards to her creative side and she is managing director of the creative business Mango Tales Limited a startup publisher of children's books and music. The business is intended to fill the gap in the media and content industry for safe, family-friendly, enjoyable entertainment experiences while promoting positive self-representation, multiculturalism, natural beauty, and environmental awareness. This entrepreneurial journey builds on everything else and has been rich with new perspective on small business operations and competition to deliver cultural products of international quality in the international market. She has published Hazel Hummingbird, one of the first in a series of children's books that we are excited to talk about today. And so we are delighted to have with us today, Natalie, how are you this afternoon? Thank you, I'm really excited to be here. I'm feeling good. Great. Good, good. We do have Mr. Rakumba Ned who will be joining us in a little bit, but we'll start and go head first into literature. So within the culture of the Caribbean, as many of you know that it was colonized. First, um, there were the indigenous people, the Arawak, the Taino, um, so many different indigenous peoples in the different islands. Then we had the influx of the Spanish that came and then 
for Jamaica, specifically the British and many other countries in the Caribbean. And so they would cap capture and enslave Africans to, be, to build upon this cash crop of sugar that became rum and other um, items that they were to trade um, the captured Africans for to go ahead and have them work all throughout the Caribbean and in Latin America and the Americas in general. And so the culture of the Caribbean is heavenly influenced by those colonizers along with the African roots. So tell us a little bit, when we talk about culture, how do you define Caribbean culture, Natalie? Thanks, Alicia. Um, that's an excellent question. The Caribbean is one of the most diverse regions in the world because um, we've had waves and waves of migration apart from the indigenous peoples who would have you know, been moving um, up and down islands and who still have pockets of, um, of communities with that pre-Columbian culture. Um, we have had the you know, mass displacement of persons of African descent with the, with the slave trade. Um, it is, it is, um, it is a that there may have been pre-Columbian trade with, with persons outside of the Americas. And then, you know, we've had um, waves of, of persons, well, mestizacion, which is really, you know, importing um, Caucasians to lighten skin tone. It's a part of, that's a part of the culture. We've had waves of, um, of Indians, um, Chinese, um, so the you know, Jews fled the Holocaust and, um, and settled in the Caribbean. And, um, and so the region is very diverse, um, but generally peaceful, which is a, a, another, another um, strength of, of the region that so many persons from different regions of the world could come and settle and, and call the Caribbean home. I'm not hearing you, you're muted for a moment there. Alicia. Hmm. Yeah, so I can go on and on. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, Caribbean, I thought that today, you know, growing up Caribbean and what it means is also very highly contextualized by, by where you grow up. So in, um, in, in the Northern Caribbean, like the Jamaica, Bahamas, Cayman, you would have more. You may you may traditionally have had more um, of a um, of a, of a, you know, with North America, and 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 that said, and the rest of the Caribbean will say that about um, about Jamaicans a lot, you know, and um, and Jamaicans feel like you know like Miami is an extension of Jamaica. So we have we have that going on. Now, and within the within the Eastern Caribbean, um, then you would have persons who who their families are very quite mixed, you know, between an Antigua and, and Antigua and Barbuda, Twin Island, um, Saint Lucia, Saint Kitts Nevis, Saint Vincent and the Grenadines, and then coming down the chain with Barbados, there's strong interaction as well. And um, and then we could, we could segue down to Trinidad, which is then also going uh, a, a, a transit point or a setting point for many Venezuelans. And that relationship is, is a strong one. And then uh, coming now uh, across um, South America, we'll have Guyana, Suriname, and, um, and from Colombia, and then coming back up, Mexico, and, and um, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, Panama, Belize. And so it, the, the Caribbean are, is really geographically, properly, those countries that share the Caribbean Sea. And there are different levels at we, which we interact to um, for, for functional reasons and in, in um, culture and socially. And um, with different waves of migration, or the Panama Canal, or different, or or you know, parts that work together to to um, 
to fight against colonial powers for independence of the region. Um, you know, we had a strong relationship between Jamaica, Cuba, South America, and, you know, and the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico are also um, a, a part of, of the mix. And so the way, the way persons identify with the Caribbean is gonna vary based on where, um, where they grew up and what their mix is, what their particular mix is. Awesome. I apologize for the interruption. We were trying to get our other uh, uh, speaker artist on, and I'm so glad it's worked out. And I see Rakumba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love it. I love it. We, we people, one people. Yes, yes. One people. And it's no, so interesting that you say that because, of course, the motto for Jamaica is out of There you go. People. That's what I mean. One people. Together we aspire, together we achieve. Yes, yeah. yes, love it, love it. Yeah, yes, yeah. Trinidadian, yes, yes. And it's uh, it's interesting that Trinidad and Jamaica uh, celebrated independence in the same month, right. you know, right. Jamaica first. Right. And then, and so we've had over, gosh, close to now, it's going to be, what, 60 years? Wow. 60 years. Come Is next it 10 years? year. So, wow, yeah, it's 10 yeah. years already. We celebrated yes. together, downtown mm, Atlanta, 19, the yeah. 50th year. The 50th, the 50th yes. Yeah. Yes, in right, 2002. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So, or 2012, yes. excuse me, 2012. So, right, yeah. right. So, it'll be yeah. 60 next year. Amazing. So, serendipity. I love it. I love it. So, we I have love it here too. this afternoon representing Trinidad, or this one is Trinidad, my doll here, and the Jamaican doll. Um, and so, <laughs> Natalie so expertly shared with us what are the countries that comprise this beautiful Caribbean that we talk about geographically okay. the, Car the countries bordering the Caribbean Sea but they are just so nuanced and diverse because right. you come from the Eastern Caribbean um, Natalie uh -huh. is from basically Caribbean proper and the Western Caribbean and okay. so there are different aspects so we're talking about what is culture and so I want to throw it to both of you when you think about your individual culture what are the things and aspects that quickly come to mind? So Rakumba, let me properly introduce you. Um, Rupert Rakumba Ned, a Trinidadian, a Trinidad and Tobago native, has spent years motivating and inspiring his students to get out of their comfort zone and realize their fullest potential. After migrating to Atlanta in 1989 as a college student, he is now seen as a go-to cultural guru that helps promote the preservation and promotion of Trinidad and Tobago cultural heritage through the arts. He is a community activist and event planner, and he is an amazing artist that uses several different media. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I had the pleasure and honor of curating a show back in, I wanna say 2017 called Visions of the Caribbean and the work that Rukumba was able to share with us was so powerful. He showed the steel pan drum. He showed the beach scene. There were so many beautiful depictions of the Caribbean that no matter what island that you associated with, it brought back memories, childhood memories. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I say to you again, uh, Rukumba, what is culture to you? What images of Trinidad comes up when you think about the Trinidadian culture? Okay, uh, and um, I'm, I'm in the parking lot. I'm waiting for them to let me in the building. So, um, but culture. First of all, let me thank you, uh, Althea, for uh, honoring me with this opportunity to speak and to share all that I am, all that I've discovered, and my mission as a, as a human being on Earth. Uh, this is truly an honor. It's also an honor to, 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 to be in the same space with someone representing uh, my home girl, representing the, the Caribbean, as we call it, uh, which is so broad and vast, it's in, incredible. And when I say broad and vast, it, takes me, it lets me home in to the concept of culture. Culture is all that we are, all that that we represent and uh, all that we share as beings on this planet Earth and universally. 
I don't think culture could be um, can be closed in. It's so broad a concept. What I do, what I would say is there's a, there's an internet intellectual definition, and there are book definitions. But culture is who we are. All and everything encompassing everything in terms of we as beings on the earth. And so specifically, when you think about Trinidadian culture, what, what are some quick things that you think about, such as your Caribbean music? For Trinidad, what's the thing that comes to mind? Specifically for Trinidad, uh, I think it, is, it continues to evolve. In terms of Trinidad, um, I had the opportunity to go to Ghana and to Panafest in Ghana. I had the opportunity to come here to the United States, to the South, and Trinidad culture is evolving. Some people define it as uh, defined through carnival uh, or festival, which is a Trinidad type carnival that incorporates a whole lot. It's not only dance, it's not only uh, music and food, some people define it as, as, as street theater, and it's unique in that is, there is not a, car, a carnival that is like Trinidad Carnival. Now, let me say this because this is also controversial. There are other festivals in the Caribbean that are similar, but unique in their own space and in their own right. When you go to Ghana and you look at how things happen, and let me also say this, most of the people in the Caribbean came from the West Coast, as apart from the uh, North. They came from the West Coast and then they came through Savannah and populated the South. And that's why I referred to the South before, that there are traits in the South that I saw as a child growing up, as well as uh, in different islands in, 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 in um, in the Caribbean. So specifically for Trinidad, for now, Steel Band, Calypso, Soka, uh, the carnival concept, and of course, we, we are, it says, together we aspire, together we achieve, we are cosmopolitan in that there's so many different cultures that have come together define what we have now and what we see now. We have the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, the English, the Indians, and we are like 50% East Indian, and the Asians into one melting pot. To produce Certainly. a food, a music, a form, an art form that is unique. And of course, some of the most beautiful women the world has ever seen, and handsome men, but let's, let's 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 not go back to so to yes that, yes yeah. so I want to get I want to get Natalie into the conversation so Rukumba says that <laughs> Carnival is the best the Trinidadian Carnival is the best Carnival so let's just dive into it I'm gonna wait till later but Carnival the concept of um, the parade <laughs> playing mass as it's called or masquerade being able to be dressed in not only the right beautiful costumes of each band but also those other very africa african centric um and the africanisms because really carnival is rooted in african tradition if you look at various festivals in africa dance is a central part of it communing with the ancestors and with the spirits to come down in celebration whether it be from farming whether it be in celebration of a particular event in the village's life, that is the essence and the foundation of what carnival is. And so, Natalie, you, you've had the privilege to live in Barbados as well. So you've had a chance to experience crop over as well as Jamaican carnival. So what are your aspects or, or observations about carnival? So uh, I'm gonna be very diplomatic, less diplomatic than Rukuma because anybody who is on it is going to get vexed with me. Um, if I take a side, 
what I will agree with is that every every country has its um unique expression and it's a vibe. Um, I, I want to agree also where in the statement that our culture is um everything about our being and who we are. So um, I'll answer it this way because um, Jamaica Carnival is a would be the the youngest carnival um, uh, of the group. You know, it wasn't um, organic to, in the same way as um, as Trinidad or as standing. And um, you know, it's it's a melting pot. It's um, it's it's more accepted. Um, by, you know, by the church in some in 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 some countries and others, and so and when he speaks about the evolving culture, I think that is something that that dynamism is definitely something that we see in the festivals because our festivals um, of different countries, you're seeing that. There are brands emerging, brands of parties, brands of so on. And so within the Caribbean, carnival culture is itself, and festival culture is itself um, evolving and moving around. So it allows us to have that, to, to actually expand the carnival culture and with everybody having their own flavor. And this is great, not only, it's, it's, it's great in terms of the, the, the melting pot of the region, but also the visibility of the different um, musicians and, and entertainers and forms. And, um, and it's, it is an experience sharing and a learning. So the, um, Hello? the festivals themselves have come together, um, have come together to be, to be a bit more coordinated so that they're not clashing with each other as much throughout the year. And um, and so that people can just really go around to, to the to the different countries and experience that. Um, it, but it's, it's not just carnival; it's also different festivals, like a, a, a an understanding and a and a respect, I believe, um, of the, the the Indian festivals, the Indian holidays, Chinese holidays, uh, throughout the, the, the calendar, and that that's very much. Um, I would the cultural integration of the Caribbean is something that is deepening. It's actually deepening um, in terms of the best experience. I mean, now you're, you're having the artists come to different countries and have shows. So everybody gets a taste of their favorite artists and, and entertainment brands developing are, around that. Um, but the experience, the experience comes in the music the experience comes in the togetherness. The experience for me definitely comes also in um, in, in in the percussions, and um, it is it is a spiritual experience, and it is an evocative experience, much like the experience of um, being at a maroon festival, and um, the maroons being. Um, those Africans that escaped slavery, um, and, and there's a strong maroon community in in, in Jamaica, but also um, connecting across the Caribbean to to other maroon communities, and and so music musical expression is spiritual expression, and does have a spiritual effect, and. Understanding that and understanding um, how to navigate that and not be overcome by it or not be afraid of it or not write it off as, um, as a, a dark side of our culture that we don't want to own or that we've evolved from, you know. Um, that is a whole, that's a whole lot of discussion. And so one thing about um, the Caribbean experience that I that I really want to point out is that Caribbean people are themselves constantly discussing and making up their minds about who they are. 
<laughs> exactly. Back to that definition of cultures who we are. I think it's yeah. phenomenal that not only do we know about Trinidadian carnival and Barbadian crop over and Jamaican carnival, but also, again, the deepening of the diaspora where you have the Notting Hill Festival in the UK and you have the Grace Jerk Festivals now in, in America, in the United States. So, and of course, uh, Mardi Gras. Miami Carnival, too. Yeah, you know. <laughs> They're all over. So an opportunity to celebrate, to bring the communities together, and to do this through food, through music, through revelry, through dance. And again, those are all through the African diaspora and it starts on the continent itself. So we want to, I can't believe it, we're almost at the halfway mark and we have so much more to talk about. So we want to quickly delve into, uh, into the art, Rukumba. Tell us about your art journey. Tell us why do you enjoy painting and using your expression of art to recreate your childhood experiences and um, celebrating your upbringing in Trinidad Tobago. All right, thank you. Yeah, and uh, you can hear me now, right? Yes. This is so much better, right? I moved to a different space. But um, first of all, uh, let me also say that uh, I echo the sentiments made by Natalie. Is it okay to call you Natalie? Yes. Yeah, I didn't. Yes, of course. Uh, sure. So um, I get the, the thread through what she's saying is, is so similar to what I said. We are evolving. We are evolving. And I, I thank you so much because with my conversation with you, Althea, I had said that carnival is so broad and it's so in, it's so interesting to hear Natalie talk about that spiritual aspect. You know, I said the political, the cultural, the social, and the spiritual. It's so it's so it's so involved, it's so embedded as we as we evolve all out of, of where we are. Um I'll get right to to my ad, but also let me say that the, the 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 place that we are in currently, we have a negative way of looking at it, but this is a super beautiful place that we are and at this point in time, and we are privileged to share this time together. We are also uh, in Africa. There's there are people are called the the Obia man and the Ugun. Uh, and Natalie and you and I are Ugoons. And by that, it's not necessarily negative. What it is is that there are a few of us here who have the mission to, to look at that inquiry, to bring home or connect Sankofa, take us back to Africa, to the roots from where we come, and to recognize that where we are now, we are in a better place. And let me talk about my art. My art, my my, and this is just they call it the, the plastic arts or the still arts. I paint, I draw, uh, and, and currently I use computer graphics to generate a lot of the images that I generate. And of course, the pan is the icon in the work that I produce. Why the steel band? As a little boy growing up. In Trinidad, I would be in the pan tents. I go to the pan yards and so on. And I was just blown away by them, by the steel band players making music from, from drums, from pans. And, and it's so complex, it's so it's so incredible. I'll be sitting down there, and that spirituality that Natalie talked about was in me. There are certain things that was in me that I could communicate and interact with with the pan and didn't know the connections. Little did I know, I was chosen to use the plan to reach out and bring together images that one day would help educate and socialize our people as to who and what we are. And that is what the plan does for me. The plan is circular. That drum, the top is circular. There is no end to it. It's continuous. And then within that circle, which is our universal, which is life, which is existence, which is morality. Nothing is destroyed. Everything changes its form. And that circle embodies our history and our culture. And, and it's amazing. 
that I started looking at the pan and I started using the pan as a motif. I wanted to play music as a child. I My uncle had a piano that we were supposed to get us and we couldn't. Playing music was for the elite in Trinidad. I can know when I put, and I can go to piano classes. Not just the elite, but the people who were different. So I had to find a way to try to make music. And as a child, I took the orange juice cans and those kinds of stuff, and I would burn them and pong them and try to create notes, but I couldn't. So I looked to the pencil and paper. And some people call it a self-made artist. I develop my images. I start drawing and sketching and so on. But deep down inside, I knew that I had to use the pan as a way of finding who I am and, and, and speaking what I had to speak through the pan. For years, I worked at home and worked by myself. And uh, I was at Tranquility, one of the um, secondary schools in Trinidad. I remember I was in the first grade or second grade um, form, first and second form at home. And I was walking through the hallway and the seniors was actually doing uh, a final for, um, I guess, getting to do O levels and A, le and, um, a levels in Trinidad. And o and A levels was the first um, in the Caribbean where it determined whether you were successful in college or not, or whether you could get a job, a scholarship, and that kind of stuff. And so I was walking through, and I said, give me a piece of paper and some paint. And I, I went with the seniors, and I painted. I created a piece of art. And actually, they didn't know that I wasn't a senior. But when the results came out, I actually passed the class. <laughs> and uh, little did they know that I was just a junior, uh, not, sorry, a freshman entering the course. That was one of the first motivating things and money things that I can remember. The thing is, what I learned, I went into take formal art as, as, as in education. I couldn't, I couldn't work because I couldn't understand when they talk about perspective and depth and like and form. I, I didn't know it. I could do it, but the intellect, I couldn't take the jargon and put it together with what I was doing. And so I struggled when I went into the formal aspect of learning art. And so I decided I needed to come out and travel. And go, first I went to England, I was chosen to go to England as an exchange teacher. Natalie, you know, you may know of that. Uh, Jamaicans, Barbadians, and Trinidadians were sent to England for second generation kids to inspire and help them because they were have struggled in England to find a place and to find themselves. And when I was there, I tried to get into a college here, I couldn't. And so I decided to look to the University of the West Indies, Jamaica, which was the seat of art, plastic arts in the Caribbean. And I tried to go to Mona, but I couldn't go to Mona. But even during that time, I never stopped working. And to the point in which I had people in Trinidad who took my work, gave me commissions, and there was this firm called Fine Arts in Atlanta. They had me do like eight pieces, they chose four, and they published the four. And the ideas, were, they were called the quartet. And you, may, you all may have it and you didn't even know, because since I'm in America, I'm finding there's so many people who has the actual piece. The four pieces were supposed to go throughout the Caribbean and America, and it was sold throughout the Caribbean in airports or what have you. And so several people bought it. And I would see, no, entering that, my name is Rupert. Before I left, I changed it to Rukumba. All my artwork had Rukumba. And so I'm interacting with people and friends, and they're saying, uh, I see your work. There's a connection with that piece that I have. But the person who um, created the piece is Rukumba. And so then I made the connection. But that piece, Circle is in Canada, it is in England. Actually, I saw it on the internet right now. Mm -hmm. And again, it is that motif. I took four aspects of the pan, created a design, and so they chose like four of them driven by color and and um and gender 
and produced these four pieces. So you would see, in fact, when I left here in 83 to come here to go to formal uh, education, I had painted maybe a thousand or more pieces. Most of them are on the steel band, and you see that steel band motif being generated in most of the work that I have. Mm -hmm. And to Althea's point, I say that on, um, I'll, I'll silence for a minute. I never gave up on the other aspects of the Caribbean. So I did paint beaches. I paint um, female, huge. I paint women. Women are a large part of my work. The matri matrilocal part, because my mom and I, we, we break bonds for a minute. But the woman is featured in my work, pan and women, pan and women. Yeah. And it's because I, I wanted to make that connection, that matrilocal setup for us as people um, the fact that women are so important in our uh, development. And so this is the reasons behind the steel band icon and the female icon that you see in most of my work. I love that. And what you shared was you are now the embodiment of the African griot that in terms of the oral traditions that happen in Africa, you have become a visual griot to be able to depict the life and the, the, the experiences of the Caribbean, which is absolutely awesome. And I didn't mention in the introduction that you are also an art teacher here in the Atlanta yes, area yes. as well. Yes, so yes. not only are you creating, you're teaching the next generation to create. And I just, I mean, your definition of the pan and the universality and the circle of life, never saw that before. So thank you again for sharing that, that image and vision with us. So we wanna pivot a little bit and get Natalie back in the conversation. And so since we've talked a little bit about art, let's go to literature. So let's go from the general to the specific, if we could, Natalie, and just tell us about what are your, as we talk about the African diaspora, we talk about the colonial influences on the people of the African diaspora and the Caribbean. What is your observation of the transition or evolution of the literature in the Caribbean, specifically in Jamaica, from having a heavy influence from the colonizers to being able to fully become independent and depict the Caribbean from a Caribbean perspective? I'm sorry, I love that question. Um, so I'll, I'll answer this way um, in terms of the comfort level that we are developing with ourselves. Um, I couldn't speak Patois until I went to high school. And it's not that I got permission, but somehow the, the mixing in high school, I just, you know, it just took off. Whereas my, my daughter at a much younger age is you know, Fluent. all into it, like all into patho, different types of patho because patho is a whole mood in itself, is a whole, you know, is <laughs> depending and, and has its own context, you know, and, and that's allowed because what was considered proper right. is different. And that's a that's a, that's a, a comfort level, but I mean I'm not gonna say it's across the board that we're there yet. We still in Jamaica have the whole conversation of what what should be the language of instruction in um in in our schools um and certainly um from a literature point of view i didn't see i didn't see black children in our books we had a series where it was dick and jane with the ball and the dog and the cat and whatever from your early formative years and um i don't think i can't remember now how that made me feel really but now that I'm in uh, in children's literature, and I think from from I had from I had my daughter, and she's almost ten, I'm just like, what? I can't read this book. This book, um, you know, an artwork. Um, you, you, know, you may have an artwork in uh, for A in in um, in Ghana maybe, but um, it it's not localized, and so there has been this disconnect between education and what we're being taught in school and our lived experience. And it's really, really problematic. And 
and you talk about the great, you know, like who is going to convey our culture to, to people? Who is going to make us not ashamed of who we are? Or who is going to settle that that um, that dissonance that we have between feeling that something is proper, but what, how we want to just rock out and dance? And, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> Who, and, and and so much of what we do is shame people about stuff that is organic that that somehow we are no longer comfortable with. And so the, the first point in the education system is comfort with yourself, and not cookie cuttering people, and um and and taking our children. And um, and our people generally, and making them okay with the, who they are, and then trying to channel them to 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 what they're they're good at or the contribution they can make. And so I think the passing on of the oral history, um, of the history and the culture, whether it's oral or whether it's verbal, is very important for us maintaining and um, and affirming our sense of identity. Um, and so Rukumba very interestingly shared that he could not process formal art education. And it's because, I think it's because we're very intuitive. There is a lot of um, knowledge that we have and we don't, we're not taught to, to give credit to. I feel like I want to cry, okay? Like, because it takes, it's such a part of your, like your your, your self-awareness and, and developing as a person. And it's so, it comes with so much tension still as we're growing up to be free to be who we are. And, um, and so when, I, I, I'm, I'm hopping around a little bit, but it's, it starts with, um, education with early childhood education and so for me there are a lot of things that um, I allow that my parents didn't allow but you know they're I'm just so happy how parents become very very flexible grandparents and they're kind of <laughs> with interest you know like what's going on here um, and you know, like I remember the first time I cut off the whole of my hair and my father didn't didn't like it. He's just like, like, oh, don't do that again. Of course, it's happened like seven or eight times throughout life. I was growing time, cut it off. Um, but something like that. What you know, what it's not it's not girly. Yeah, and and I remember after high school, I had gotten an interview and I was gonna work with Air Jamaica and I had to cream my hair, I had to relax my hair because you just can't go to work like that. So, but now we're more we're more comfortable in some spaces. You're still going to get it. You know, when I had my daughter, it was like, oh, she brown. You know, she's you know these <laughs> things that you don't expect to hear in 2021. But all of that comes from the the, the messages, the cues that we would have received in the different learning contexts. And if we don't have some black children in the books, then subliminally it's, you know, it's saying black children aren't in books. And it 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 um it makes them question, well, what is our place in the world? And then they have to pick up cues from their place in the world from, from social context. So let I I Quickly before this the session, I um I picked up this book and it's 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 called I'm trying to get my angles right Rainbow Readers. You see this with um is actually produced by a Trinity company in collaboration with um with with Jamaica. Um, and this is a primary school book now. And this, you know, it didn't happen. I'm a little bit over forty, and it didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen when I was growing up in school, you know? When I was in high school and we had Green Days by the River, I think in first or second form, this was scandalous because it was a Trinidadian book and a, a, you know, a, a, a black boy with an Indian girl. And <laughs> it, you know, it, that was my real introduction to 
the rest of the Caribbean and Miguel Street. And I'm just like, whoa, there's something bigger here. Some um are going on. And then um and then you know going to, to the States and you know, I would say I I mixed more with other Caribbean people in that context than I had ever before with the Jamaican Association, the Caribbean Students Association, and so on. And then after you know, after a couple of years, um and you know and um and you know uh, in in Barbados and then back in Jamaica, um, with some stops in between. But in terms of literature, um, the an identity, um, it going to the states made me more interested in this concept of Jamaicanness or Caribbean, and um, and. And it was because of needing to be in a community when you're in when in you're in the US. No, Miami is not the typical America. <laughs> Let's just <laughs> call it for, for what it is. Um, and and so I mean there was the mix with everybody Caribbean, you know, people from the DR, people from Puerto Rico, Cubans. A lot of Cubans in Miami and so on. So your the definition of Caribbean for me was already very wide by being in Miami and taking the jitney to the mall, you know, and going um and and, and interacting in, in Haitians in a way that you hadn't before because you had a negative connotation of Haitians, um, you know, from 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 the Jamaican context, um, and of Haiti in terms of the poverty, the disaster. So so on, and so the 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 way we even exchange information among ourselves has to has to change, and um, so but leaving Miami, I went to real America when I uh, I moved to Maryland and I was doing school in Virginia, and passing through, I got visual cues about who black people were. I got visual cues based on how they were dressed and if they're gonna, where they're gonna come off if they work at the World Bank or the IMF or wherever, or if they're, you know, if they're coming off in, in Union Station or DC or which where's their stuff and how are they in overalls or not, and this and and being the only black person in my class sometimes, or or being in a class with an African-American student, but knowing that you're different or being asked by your lecturer, you know, with all, all the caveats of not wanting to be offensive, what makes Caribbean people different? And I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna come down to the cues that we have, um, you know, having seen um, uh, black leaders, having seen Black authors, we, we pride ourselves about having, you know, Nobel laureates and you know, and award-winning um, authors, um, and that's that's also confidence. Um, so, Natalie, and, tell yeah. me about, if I could, tell me about some of these cultural heroes in Jamaica. Who are some people who, whether literary or culturally, who are some names that we should be familiar with that have been um, the the couriers of, of culture in Jamaica. Okay, so uh, for me, um, you know, growing up, I would say that um, the poets we had to do in the classroom um, a lot of recitation of poetry, and Claude McKay, and um, you know, um, we we read Olive Senior, we. We read Rex Nettleford, a bit or static. He was definitely on TV a lot um, and started to become more familiar with the writers on Caribbean culture. But this, there still, there was still a lot of gaps because, let's say, you have to, you have to choose. So around third form, which I will, you know, I don't know what grade that is. Um, but you're going to have to choose if you're going to do literature, which is where you get more into the Caribbean literature, or if you um, 
or if you're going to you know do a science or something like that which is something else i have a problem with so the humanities isn't isn't widely um um it, it's not across the board in terms of your your exposure to um to to the literature in high school so it's more concentrated based. so literature gets boxed in to the educational curriculum and accessible only to certain people who specialize mm, interesting. And, and so, so for so for me that's that's a problem and then um you know later on in university then that is just amplified because you'll be going on different tracks you don't have to learn caribbean history so for my experience was learning it a lot afterwards in terms of coming back um, once I have to you know affirm this Caribbean identity in a foreign space and 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 to, and to come back right um, and so um, so you're asking about naming authors it's 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 really difficult it depends on um, on on who um, on your genre in terms of young adults are are um, our children's are not, and children's is growing. So um, um, I'll, I'll name some now um, in terms of children. Um, there are Tanya Batson Savage, Ta yeah, Tanya Batson Savage, um, who is doing a, a lot of young adult work. Um, Kelly Magnus, um, when when I, my daughter was young, Kelly Magnus books were few. Um, one of the few that you'd find that had black characters, and she you know, had a, a a nice um a nice uh, little children hero story and a series, um, and kind of opened the door for I think uh, a lot of other children's children's authors. Um, and um, if we let's see, there's just there there's just so many um, now. Um, recently, um, I'd say Nicole Dennis Ben, who is writing a lot about her Jamaican experience and uh, growing up, and um, and also the the experience from um, you know from persons who don't do not identify as binary. So we're we're getting into diversity in that aspect of our culture. And Marlon James. Um, who also write about those those experiences. Um, we have Edwidge Dante Cat, who is from Haiti, and who spends a lot of time of her work, including in children's books, um, writing on um, the the Haitian experience and immigration, and what it's like to be a Haitian in in America. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll keep them coming. Like I, yeah. I admire her a lot. Um, um, I, I like Rex Nettleford's work a lot because he gets into the the deep of um, of this. I won't call it schizophrenia, but this um, this this difficulty in Caribbean people deciding what to keep. And, um, and what not to keep from their colonial um, past, um, even interrogating the Jamaican motto of out of many one people, you know, like when is it too blended rather than, um, yeah, rather than acknowledging the Rastas more, Africans more. Um, Donna Hope is, uh, is another, she's a contemporary. Um, she actually studied in the States as well when I was at George Mason too. Um, and Donna gets into like the dance hall culture and how there I'll say schizophrenic Jamaica is about the culture in terms of when it make money for them as opposed to the culture uh, when we are getting a very naked and bare reflection of what is happening. Um, our artists talking about what um, Oh, are they talking about their reality and to what extent are they shaping culture? Oh, oui. so so um, interesting. Then there's um, you know like Vereen Shepherd. Um, Vereen Shepherd talks about um, about gender relations and um, and 
you know, and how the, the women's movement has evolved and looks at, um, at, you know, women figures and how they have evolved. And um, just, you know, interrogating the, the, the women. There's, I mean, there's just so many. Anthony Winkler. There are. Yes. Uh, yeah, Anthony Winkler is a, um, is a Chinese Jamaican and he did a whole series that, um, that was almost like travel writing because he was talking about himself in the context of a culture in which he was Jamaican, but but also othered, you know, he, he was he Jamaican, but not quite Jamaican. But and and this is also really interesting now because when we mention um uh, like the Chinese Jamaican, because you know we have a new wave of immigration that's also affecting the the way um uh, uh, Chinese. Um, Sino influences are, are affecting the, the culture. Uh, you know, they don't feel recognized enough. Um, there, I was in one forum where they they thought um, and um, and Indians it what came up that that they weren't represented enough in Jamaican culture, weren't visible enough after having been such an important part and such a you know big part of the representation. Um, so it's it it's really it's really difficult and I, I feel very nervous because then I feel like I'm not doing justice to, to the, the breadth uh, of the slide. It's a lot, the breadth and depth of it. But I do want to just highlight a couple of things as it relates to culture and literature. One of the cultural icons in Jamaica is Miss Lou. Louise Bennett, I think, singularly yeah. was able to help Jamaicans as a whole to realize that, you know, yes, everyone wants to be speaky spokey and uh, proper and intellectual and, you know, hold on to that British um, way or system of life and culture. But she said, no. And you not only should be proud of the dialect, that it was not a bastardization of the languages, but it, they were derivatives of the African culture. She was the first person that talked about our connection with the Ghanaian coast and that the language of the people was twi. And there are several different words that we use that we just thought were made up words. But in fact, yeah. this is we learned on High on the Hog that okra, the word for okra was gumbo. And that's where we get the name gumbo from. The same thing with pinda was the name for peanut in Ghana. And there are several different words that we use. When I went to Ghana and I saw the word nyam, on a restaurant, and I said, "Wait a minute, that's not Jamaican." <laughs> Jamaican, <laughs> you know. So, and, and just the Africanism. So, being able to understand and research the connection and make us proud of who we are, and to proudly use patwa, because as Natalie said, in Jamaican households, and even for me in America, we are not allowed to talk speak patwa in the house or even watch Oliver Samuels because they wanted us to be able to assimilate into the American culture and not be ridiculed. But instead, Louise Bennett was able to share with us who have every reason to be able to speak in dialect and to be proud of your culture. Another tidbit is um, many Caribbean schools or even families tell the story of Anansi the spider. That story comes from Africa and it's very much highlighted in Ghana and other West African countries. So uh, Rukumba was very correct in talking about the coast of Af the West Coast of Africa had a direct influence on many of the cultures here in the Caribbean. We are at the three minute mark. I cannot believe this hour has gone so quickly. So we just want to kind of wrap up, thank our guests. If there are any quick questions, feel free to leave a comment in the chat and um, certainly would like to get to it. So Rukumba, I'd love for you to go ahead and just share with us. Oh, are we ready to wrap up, Dr. Ojala? Okay. <laughs> it feels too quick. I know, I know, this is such a great discussion. So I just wanted to, to ask, looking ahead, what are your hopes and dreams for the people of the Caribbean and how the expression of the Caribbean is, is seen throughout the world? Uh, I, I think this is a beginning. This is indeed a beginning. Uh, there, there's so much to talk about. There's so much to see. And this has, has been a tremendous learning opportunity for me. Uh, one of my major, one of the mentors, principals in my life, she talked about lifelong learners, lifelong learning. 
And I hope this is just the beginning. There's so many things that she touched on in literature that is so much part of who I am. But let me summarize it by saying this. There are two major, um, we talk about cultures here in two, two major ways of looking at the world and what it is. And this encapsulates, encapsulates most of what I said and what we are about. See, oral tradition is a form of culture. Oral tradition in Africa, what I've learned, and I learned proverbs, I learned them from Trinidad and from my literature. Those people who were primary in my life are not, not well known. Primus was the guy who walked in the streets. Primus talked about African traditions, African practices, but he talked in the square. And he en 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 enlightened me or energized me to find out about my Africanism, what it is and who it is. And, I, and let, let me get back to oral traditions. One of my paintings is oral traditions. In Africa, things are not maintained in books. The history, the culture, it's, not, it's passed down from, the, from the, the chiefs. That's what school is. The chief sits down and he educates the kids and he tells the kids, so the, the fascination about the African mind blows my mind as someone who came from the diaspora, how much they could keep in their minds and, 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 and in their heads, not in books. Whereas Anglo-Saxon and the Western world was books. So that when you, when you destroy the books as one part of changes in the world, they burn all the books, you burn the history of the people as yeah. opposed to oral tradition. And that's one of the things that I thought. I talked about in school and I can deal with the intellectualism. That's what I learned from my answer. I found it in, in the South. Uh, um, the proverbs, those things that my parents told me, you know, how you lay your bed, you will lie. Those things cannot be defined easily in English. And so uh, let me end up by saying I'm a teacher, yes, but I was part of that group of people who develop a curriculum for the Caribbean. And during that process, which is, which, which is what I'm working on now with the Spanish speaking kids, we recognized and appreciated what we call, um, we call Ebonics in America, that those languages embodied so much. Paul Keen, when Calypso, Soka, when they speak, Sparrow, children go to school and learn, well, otherwise later on in life, you will catch well hell without an education in your head. Your whole life would be so miserable. You better off dead. There is simply no place in this whole wide world for an uneducated little boy or girl. Don't allow idle companions to put you astray to earn tomorrow. You can learn today, Calypso. Calypso, those songs, those those traditional things that I didn't have when I went to England. It's amazing I was in England and they wanted to find out about the uh, Trinidad and I was telling them, oh, England is a pleasant place for those that are rich and I, but England is such a cool place for such poor folks that, as I, for such a poor man as I near shall see again as the British I, as a chorus of Spanish men. Those are what I learned in school. Everything English, nothing about back home. So let's hope that this is the beginning. I enjoyed everything you said. I um, Natalie, they're so connected. We always have this fighting between Jamaica and Trinidad, but we are so unique. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, I was just writing, taking notes. I'm enjoying this. It's so much of who and what I am. I thank you for out here to bring us together. It's thank you. Thank you. And Natalie, your closing thoughts. Yeah, thanks. I'm like a new friend. Um, but um, so, you know, uh, it was mentioned that I used to work with CARICOM, and I think that was a, quite a, it was a high point for me because um, I, you know, I went to all the countries and, um, and it helped to really, you know, affirm me as a person, as a, as a Caribbean woman. Um, I wanted to, my closing thought has to do with the link between the Caribbean and America because the Caribbean has always fought for Africans in America. And I just wanted to just, just, just 
with us through our music with Bob Marley, with from Buffalo Soldiers, which he sang about. <laughs> um, you know, we recognize the Gula Gichi people um, in um, in the Carolinas. We we recognize the the continued struggle, <laughs> and I mean the Caribbean whether through positions in the United Nations or through letters to Congress, through their, you know, through our political network, the Caribbean has always fought for um, for um, African Americans in the United States. And if you'll allow me, I wanted to I mention Claude McKay. So this is one of the poems that we would grow up um, there, um, reading and reciting. It's called, If We Must Die. And um it goes like this if we must die let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs making their mock at our accursed lot if we must die oh let us nobly die so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us though dead O kinsmen so, you know, we feel you and we're with you. And, um, you know, I want to say there are really through Instagram, I'm, I'm meeting people who are trying to promote the African American cultures. We need diverse books, Black Book Matters, you know, you know, Books and Bros, Marley Diaz. So, you know, we, we're making the links through the arts and we'll continue to do so. Thank you so much. So as you can see, the complexity of the Caribbean <laughs> and the issues of colorism and still the immigration issues. And I mean, there's so much that we can continue the conversation, but I just personally want to thank both of you. I thank you for the influence on my life and that I, it was an amazing conversation. So thank you again, Dr. Ojolade, for this opportunity and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Alicia. I, I'm literally over here in tears as I've been listening to the conversation as an African-American woman that grew up and I grew up in Los Angeles and went to good white schools. I didn't even know the Caribbean was predominantly populated by people of African ancestry when I was growing up. That wasn't until I was an adult. And it makes me recognize the ways in which um, so-called education um, is really designed to be miseducation -edu for mm -hmm. people throughout the diaspora. So as I listen to this conversation and, and hearing Natalie talk about books and making the connections with the Buffalo Soldiers and the Gullah Geechee culture and Brother uh, Rakumba talking um, about the work that he does and um, his difficulty of being able to connect with um, formal formal, if you will, um, art education, it makes me recognize why I continue to do this work. And even though it is work that sometimes people will wonder like, well, what does that have to do with psychology? As you have proven today in this conversation, all of this has to do with the mental health of people of African ancestry throughout the globe. Because if we don't have images and books that look like ourselves, if we don't have um, music, if we don't have art that expresses our culture, then we are lost. So I want to thank each of you, Alethea, for always just being an amazing woman that always has my back in everything. And even in this um, great dialogue that you've had today, Sister Natalie, thank you again from Jamaica, my brother Rakumba here in Atlanta with us, but all the way from Trinidad, Tr Tobago. Again, thank you, each of you, for this um, amazing conversation. I have learned so much. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, we are here for the rest of the week. We are still celebrating Carib Caribbean American heritage. On Wednesdays, we're on, we're on Instagram. On Fridays, we're here right at 12 o'clock Eastern time. And we are continuing to have this conversation. Next week, we're going to talk about Caribbean mental health, and we're going to bring our brothers in. So it's going to be a conversation uh -huh. of all, black, uh, all men of African descent talking about Caribbean <laughs> mental health. So hope to see you there. Take care. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Congrats on your work. Thanks for having us.